Imagine you're a young scientist who just presented your new and possibly revolutionary idea at a scientific conference. Now imagine that one of the most respected scientists in your field and one of your own PhD advisors presents right after you and rips your idea to shreds, attacking your reputation and questioning your ability as a scientist. Believe it or not, this actually happened to one of the greatest scientists of the 20th century, the Indian-born astrophysicist Subramanian Chandrasekhar. In this video, we are going to address the following questions. Who was Chandra Sekhar, or Chandra as some people knew him? Who was attacking him, and what was this beef all about? And whose sides did people pick? And in the end, who was right? And what legacy did this beef leave? All of that and more on this first episode of Physics Beef. Subramanian Chandrasekhar was born on October 19, 1910, in the Punjab province of British India. He came from an educated family. His paternal uncle was Nobel laureate Sir C. V. Raman, a name that chemists might recognize if they've ever done Raman spectroscopy. Yeah, it was named after him, just in case you didn't know. Chandrasekhar obtained a bachelor's degree in physics from Madras University in 1930 and obtained a scholarship to pursue graduate studies at Trinity College, Cambridge. While on his voyage to England in July of 1930, Chandra Sekhar began applying concepts from Einstein's relativity and the exciting new field of quantum mechanics to deduce certain properties of white dwarfs, a type of stellar remnant left over after a star dies. White dwarfs are an end state for stars that have a mass less than about eight times the mass of our sun. While they have masses comparable to the sun, they're often only slightly bigger than the Earth in size. This makes them one of the densest objects in the entire universe. For instance, a sugar cube of white dwarf material would weigh more than a car on Earth. One year later, in 1931, Chandrasekhar would publish a paper stating that the maximum mass a white dwarf could attain was 0.91 times the mass of our sun, which he would eventually revise a few years later to the familiar 1.44 times the mass of the sun that those of us in astrophysics are familiar with. Now this is important to remember, because it was this theoretical mass limit, what we now call the Chandrasekhar limit, that eventually led to the nightmare scenario I described at the very beginning. But be patient, this beef is still a few years away. Upon arriving at Cambridge, Chandrasekhar began his PhD work with Ralph Fowler, an expert in thermodynamics and statistical mechanics to study the properties of both regular stars and white dwarfs. Over the course of his PhD, Chandrasekhar would make connections to giants in physics, such as Edward Milne, Max Born, Paul Dirac, and even Niels Bohr. However, the connection that matters to this story the most was with none other than Sir Arthur Eddington. Who was Arthur Eddington, you may ask? Just the guy who experimentally confirmed Einstein's general relativity in 1919. No big deal, right? On May 29th, 1919, Eddington traveled to the island of Principe off the west coast of Africa to observe a solar eclipse. During the eclipse, Eddington took photographs of stars in the vicinity of the sun and discovered that the sun's gravitational field had deflected the light from these stars by an amount that was in good agreement with Einstein's theory. Eddington's verification propelled Einstein to the heights of fame we attribute to him today. Eddington himself became a household name in physics from then on, and became the leading authority in Britain on Einstein's theory and the newly developing field of astrophysics. By all accounts, Chandrasekhar and Eddington got along well during Chandrasekhar's PhD years. Chandrasekhar had immense respect and admiration of Eddington, and Eddington recognized Chandrasekhar's unquestionable intellect. Eddington would visit Chandrasekhar in his room to discuss his work, and the two would often eat together at Cambridge's high table. Eddington also served as one of Chandrasekhar's examiners at his PhD thesis defense in 1933, which he of course passed. Given the nature of their relationship, Chandrasekhar was woefully unprepared for what was about to happen to him at the 1935 Royal Astronomical Society meeting in London. Shortly before the meeting occurred, Eddington had asked the organizers to let him present immediately after Chandrasekhar titling his presentation, Relativistic Degeneracy. In an ominous encounter before the meeting between Chandrasekhar, Bill McCrea, who was a friend of his, and Eddington, McCrea asked Eddington, Well, Professor Eddington, what are we to understand by relativistic degeneracy? In reply, Eddington turned to Chandrasekhar and said, That's a surprise for you. Now, if that doesn't sound like something bad was about to happen, then I don't know what does. At this meeting, Chandrasekhar presented essentially the culmination of his work on white dwarfs. The work that he had started at 19 years old on that boat from India to England was now on full display for the Royal Astronomical Society to see. 
Despite his nerves, Chandrasekhar gave an outstanding presentation, highlighting the key result that the maximum mass a white dwarf could achieve was 1.44 times the mass of the sun, known today as the Chandrasekhar limit. After a polite applause from the audience, Eddington was then invited to speak. And now, the scenario I described at the beginning of this video began to unfold. The beef was about to begin. Eddington's presentation completely ripped into Chandrasekhar's work, completely denying the existence of the Chandrasekhar limit by claiming that Chandrasekhar had made errors in his calculations, and arguing that, quote, there should be a law of nature to prevent a star from behaving in this absurd way. He claimed that Chandrasekhar's technique of combining quantum mechanics and Einstein's relativity was unjustified, and even said that he did not, quote, regard the offspring of such a union as born in lawful wedlock. To Chandrasekhar's horror, he was not even allowed to respond to Eddington's presentation before the next presenter was called. The young, 24-year-old astrophysicist's claims were completely denounced by the leading authority of the subject. Over the next couple of months, Chandrasekhar would attempt to reach out to leading experts in quantum mechanics, such as Niels Bohr, Paul Dirac, and Wolfgang Pauli, to garner support for his application of quantum mechanical principles in his white dwarf calculations. In letters between Chandrasekhar and his friend, Leon Rosenfeld, who was working with Niels Bohr at the time, the opinion of quantum mechanics experts were undoubtedly in Chandrasekhar's favor. In one letter, Rosenfeld writes, quote, Bohr and I are absolutely unable to see any meaning in Eddington's statements. In another, Rosenfeld says, quote, After having courageously read Eddington's paper twice, I have nothing to change in my previous statements. It is the wildest nonsense. This paper was also forwarded to Wolfgang Pauli, who also agreed that Eddington's application of quantum mechanics was flawed. Although private correspondences with these figures showed that they sided with Chandra Sekar over Eddington, they did not come up publicly to support him and his ideas. They thought that this was a dispute amongst astronomers and astrophysicists that they did not want to get involved in, especially if it wasn't their primary field of expertise, and if it came at the price of publicly challenging a figure of Eddington's status. Meanwhile, Eddington would continue his attacks on Chandrasekhar's ideas at various meetings, such as one at Harvard where he called his ideas a, quote, stellar buffoonery, and one at the International Astronomical Union meeting in Paris where he called his work, quote, simple heresy. These attacks by Eddington deeply hurt and shook Chandrasekhar. He said that it was, quote, a totally unexpected occurrence that nearly came to destroying my scientific confidence. In fact, in 1939, after publishing his classic textbook, An Introduction to the Study of Stellar Structure, where he details the theoretical framework for both regular stars and white dwarfs, Chandrasekhar would leave the field and would not revisit the subject for more than 25 years. In this time, Chandrasekhar would make invaluable contributions to fields such as stellar dynamics, which describes the collective motions of stars due to their mutual gravity, radiative transfer, which is the study of energy transfer in the form of electromagnetic radiation, and hydrodynamics, the branch of physics focused on studying the motions of fluids. All of these subjects are applied in an astrophysical context and are some of the defining pillars of astrophysics today. In their last encounter at a scientific meeting in Paris of 1939, before the onset of World War II, Eddington again critiqued Chandrasekhar's work on white dwarfs, but later offered an apology by saying, I am sorry if I hurt you this morning. I hope you are not angry with what I said. To which Chandrasekhar asked, You haven't changed your mind, have you? When Eddington replied no, Chandrasekhar responded with, What are you sorry about then? Before promptly walking away. Sadly, this would be the last encounter these two would have before Sir Arthur Eddington died in 1944. Chandrasekhar has since expressed regret over this final encounter, and correspondences between them during the years of 1939 and 1944 showed that despite Eddington's attacks, their personal relationship remained intact, as letters between them show levels of warmth and humor. In the decades after Eddington's death, Chandrasekhar would always speak highly of his former PhD examiner and colleague, in one instance calling him, quote, the greatest astrophysicist of his time. Clearly, the respect and admiration he had for Eddington's achievements never left, despite their differences. But the question still remains, why did Eddington do this? Why didn't he express his conflicting views to Chandrasekhar privately, and choose to do it at that meeting in 1935, especially when they communicated often in the months leading up to that meeting? The answer is not clear, but we do know a few things. To start, the Chandrasekhar limit implied that not all stars ended up as white dwarfs, which is what Eddington and much of the larger astronomical community thought at the time. The Chandrasekhar limit also brought up an uncomfortable question. What happens to a white dwarf that exceeds that limit? Chandrasekhar and others did not try to make any definitive claims about the consequences of such a scenario at the time, because our understanding of physics just wasn't quite ready yet for the bizarre answers that lay ahead. Today, we know that there are three types of stellar remnants, white dwarfs, 
neutron stars, and black holes. In summary, we now know that white dwarfs above the Chandrasekhar limit will further collapse into a neutron star, an extremely dense object that has a mass comparable to the Sun, but confined to a size of several kilometers. Neutron stars themselves have a mass limit known as the tolman oppenheimer volkoff limit that, if exceeded, will lead to the further collapse of the object into a black hole, a point of infinite density and where nothing, not even light, can escape. But we have the benefit of hindsight. Back in the 1930s, there was no observational evidence for the existence of either neutron stars or black holes, and only a handful of observations of white dwarfs to study their behavior. In fact, the neutron itself was discovered in 1932, and the first pieces of observational evidence of neutron stars weren't made for another three decades. As for black holes, the term itself did not even exist until the 1960s, and the first object to be considered a black hole, Cygnus X1, was not discovered until 1972. Clearly, Chandrasekhar was lacking in observational evidence in support of his ideas, but he also lacked the fame and name recognition that Eddington had in this affair. In addition, Chandrasekhar's status as an Indian in Britain at the time has led some to believe that Eddington's actions were racially motivated. India was still a British colony at the time, and undoubtedly there were people in Britain who unfairly saw Indian immigrants as second-class citizens. However, in an interview regarding racism towards Indians in Britain, Chandrasekhar said, quote, In Britain, I had no problems. And specifically while in Cambridge said, quote, We were treated, if anything, with more consideration that we thought we deserved. Nonetheless, these ideas of Eddington's attack being rooted in racism have tainted this controversy ever since, but we'll never know for sure. We do know that Eddington's reputation in Britain was enough to convince many in the astronomical community that Chandrasekhar's ideas were incorrect. He was a titan and founder of modern astrophysics, and even if some people within the community sided with Chandrasekhar, they weren't willing to challenge Eddington publicly. Thankfully, this white dwarf story does have a happy ending. In 1983, more than 50 years after that boat ride from India to Britain, Subramanian Chandrasekhar was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for his contributions to the theory of stellar structure and evolution, vindicating the ideas that Eddington had so harshly attacked five decades earlier. With the Nobel Prize, Chandrasekhar became the second Indian to win the award, following his uncle C.V. Raman. For Chandrasekhar, however, it was a bittersweet moment. Stellar structure and evolution was one of his earliest works, and he felt that the award downplayed the success he had in other fields following his departure from it. Perhaps it was a sad reminder of how he had to exit the field initially, being chastised by Eddington and not having his ideas taken seriously by a man he had so deeply admired. Chandrasekhar would live for another 12 years and died in 1995 at the age of 84. His legacy, though, cannot be understated. After leaving Cambridge, he took a professorship at the University of Chicago and mentored roughly 50 students to the completion of their PhDs over five decades. Over his lengthy career, Chandrasekhar amassed a number of awards in addition to the Nobel Prize, such as the National Medal of Science, the Henry Draper Medal, and the Copley Medal. NASA's Chandra Observatory, a space telescope, was named after him to honor his contributions to the field of astrophysics and observes the universe in the X-ray regime. Chandrasekhar's work on white dwarfs is felt to this very day. By finding that they weren't the only possible end stages of stars, he illuminated the path towards their denser counterparts, neutron stars and black holes both of which are highly active fields of astrophysical research today. The Chandrasekhar-Eddington controversy reminds us that science is a human endeavor, and that nobody, no matter how smart and accomplished, can still fall victim to their own prejudices and preconceived ideas. Chandrasekhar pushed our knowledge of white dwarfs to its limit, but the astronomical community at the time simply wasn't ready to accept his new ideas. Nowadays, the Chandrasekhar limit is a well-known fact taught to up-and-coming astrophysicists and will always serve as a reminder that even in the face of extreme opposition, the truth will eventually have its day. I'm Kyle Cabasares, and that was Physics Beef. Thanks for watching. Hey guys, if you're still here at the end, I just want to say thank you so much for staying and watching all the way through, and please consider subscribing and liking the video because I'd love to I'd love to make more videos like this essentially. It was a very fun project for me to do. I have never done anything like this before that took this much planning to put on YouTube, but it was an extremely fun process and I would totally do it again for another historical event like this. So if you have any suggestions uh, of what event I should possibly cover, I would I would definitely love to hear um, your feedback and any suggestions you may have. So once again, thanks so much for watching, and I hope you guys have a wonderful day. Thank you.